We've been talking about life hacks and uh, we've been, this is part number four and last part of life hacks and this whole idea of a life hack, you know, when you're looking it up on YouTube and all the other stuff where you'll see life hacks coming at you, it's taking these simple, easy kind of ways to take complex, uh, accomplish familiar tasks with greater ease, greater efficiency. Um, and, uh, you know, the difference, though, is that when you try to do that in, in life, you can come across using some really humble things for something you never thought they could be used in this way and come up with some ingenious thing. But in the Christian life, a life hack is not about trying to uh, avoid a difficult circumstance or challenges and those sorts of stuff, but it is about taking something that might be just so simple, something that you've rated as, oh, well, that's just such a simple thing and not understand that the profoundness of that simple thing that's not simplistic can actually make you a greater more effective more powerful believer in your life as you follow Christ we are hoping that these ideas that we've been talking about as we've discovered and 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 kind of talked into the whole ideas of hope and uh, faith and love uh, were ideas that you could implement into your life and see your life become more fruitful. That's the goal, that's the hope. See your life become more impacting. See your life become more authentic as you would follow in Christ's ways in these areas. And tonight we're gonna to talk on thankfulness and generosity, believing that these two are things that when applied into your life are going to make you a more effective, a more generous, a, a more uh, a authentic follower of Jesus Christ. And so that's what we're going to talk into tonight. Have you ever got to the place uh, at home where you've either walked into your walk-in robe or you've undone the cupboard and you've stood there and you've gone, I've got nothing to wear. Okay, maybe it's not you, but maybe you've heard those words in your house. Maybe somebody else might be sitting next to you or not, I don't know, might have said, I've got nothing to wear. My kids, they walk to the fridge and they open it and they go, there's nothing to eat. They close it, they walk away, they go into the pantry, they walk back to the fridge, miraculously hoping that as they've walked two meters that way, two meters back this way, that when they open the fridge, something delightful is just gonna jump out at them and they open it up, there's still nothing to eat. You ever done that? Uh, perhaps it is that you've gone to turn on the television and you've clicked the remote and you've looked and you've said this. Actually, you were quite right. There was nothing to watch on television. More accurately, nothing worth watching, right? But so often in life, when, when we think this way, we fall into the trap of thinking about what we don't have. We think out of our lack rather than out of the gratitude of what we already have. And I think that there's something about focusing on what we have instead of what we don't have that is the, the starting point for change that will bring gratitude into our lives, that will bring a thankfulness into our lives. There's something about a grateful spirit that can shift your whole entire mood. There's something about being thankful that can change the, the, the way your brain is thinking about things that affects the whole rest of your body. That you can actually be grateful for something in that regards. Michael Ramsden said, we're not made happy in life by what we acquire, but by what we appreciate. It's not by what we acquire. That's not, happy people aren't the people with the most stuff in life. Happy people are people who are actually thankful and appreciative for what they actually have. From a Christian perspective, I think we could probably define thankfulness like this. A predetermined response that comes from looking beyond our blessings, the, the things we maybe have, what we've accomplished, accumulated, whatever, uh, looking beyond our blessings to their source. Thankfulness is actually about seeing things from a father's perspective and recognizing that he alone is the source of all good things. See, as followers of Jesus, we've got so much to be thankful for. 
And yet we, we can so infrequently stop to actually recognize what we have and be happy for what we have, be thankful for what we have, appreciate what we have. Far too often, I think we get caught up in the pull of society that just wants you to be thinking about the thing you don't have so that you just work a little harder or you do what you could to accomplish that, to have it. And, and we, we lack in society this, this settled spirit that is just grateful for what we have. And there seems to be a push to, of urgency to always want the next thing, to acquire something new. So the first life hack that I want to speak about tonight in regards to thankfulness is this. Stop and be thankful. That's simple. This is simple. It's hardly clever, but it's a simple, effective life hack, life hack that's actually going to change the way you start to live your life. Stop and be thankful. I think truly become people that are thankful, to actually have thankfulness as a part of our character. We have to intentionally stop and be mindful of what all that God has done and is doing within our lives. This is a part of the reason that we as a church are trying hard to build a, a culture of testimony, is that one of the fruits of testimony is thankfulness. You know, when people stand up and they give glory to God for what He's done in their life, they're doing so with a thankful spirit. They're thankful for all that He's done. And as Christians, we just have so much to be thankful for. We just heard tonight from three guys who are so thankful that they've been forgiven, that they're saved from death, that they have an eternal security and, and their salvation. They've been adopted as God's children. There's an internal inheritance that now is theirs. And on top of all of those wonderful things, we have a good, good Father who cares for our every need. The Bible tells us that every good, perfect gift comes from above in James. This means that every good thing you have actually comes from God. You see, when we start to understand that God is in the business of blessing, God is in the business of bestowing blessing, of giving gifts, of helping people, all that we've acquired actually has done, done so, been that way, because we've been dependent on the grace of God. Job accurately summarized our condition. It said, naked I came from my mother's womb, he said, and naked I shall return. The Lord gave and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. See, Job knew what it was like to find blessing in the Lord. Not blessings from the things that he had, not blessings from the, the things. And he was at that point in time touted as one of the wealthiest mans in the whole world. And, and yet when he lost it all, he still was able to eventually say, I bless the Lord. Because he knew that blessing came from God, not from what he accumulated within his life. And we easily assume this sense of ownership, I think, of our possessions, don't we? Do you do that? I can tell you on Christmas morning, coming up here very shortly, there'll be some kids who, are little kids who will bring their, their one Christmas present they're allowed to bring to church with them, you know? And, and they'll bring that and, and they'll play it and there'll come another little kid who will want to play with that toy that they just got that morning for Christmas. And you watch what they do. Oh, you out playing with this. It's mine. And I don't know how much that changes as we get older. The toys get a little bigger. The toys get more expensive. The stuff we accumulate is more. And yet there seems to be a, a selfishness amongst us that just says, well, that's mine. We, we have this sense of ownership about it as if we have a right to because they belong to us. We've earned them. But everything that is good in your life doesn't come by what you did to deserve it. It came from God. And this understanding that God is good and he loves to bless is why the psalmist's constant refrain is to thanks, give thanks to God for he is good. His love is endures forever. 
And it's out of this awareness that we become thankful. In the New Testament, Paul puts it this way to the uh, instructing believers. He says, and whatever you do, whether it be in word or deed, do it all in the name of Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him, through Jesus. Knowing that God has supplied all of our needs, that's the key to being thankful. When we understand that he supplied all of our needs, that's when gratitude wells up in our hearts. Philippians 4 puts it this way, my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. It does not say God will meet some of your needs. It does not say God will meet your most desperate of needs. What does that scripture passage say? God will meet all. He'll meet all of your needs. This means that, that God is is looking to be trusted. He's looking for us to be able to live in a, a faith place where we do actually trust him to meet all of our needs. Because he's committed to actually doing that. So we can rejoice always. We can live in thankfulness because God has committed to himself to providing all our needs. Billy Graham once said that God has given you two hands, one to receive and one to give. It's like that conduit of heaven, isn't it? One hand in heaven, one hand on earth, one hand as these kingdom priests receiving the goodness of what heaven has for this earth right now and us in between as the conduit of God's blessing in lives. We are blessed to be a blessing. He takes and desires that we receive from him so that we can give to other people. And this means that when we live in thankfulness, we live lives of incredible generosity. You see, you can't separate the two out. Thankfulness breeds generosity. They're, they're linked together. And it's when we understand just how committed God is to providing for us, it's then, it's at that moment when you truly understand that God is good. He's your dad in heaven who will provide all of your needs. It's at that point in time that you can actually let go of the poverty mentality, the mentality that wants to stranglehold everything that you have just in case God doesn't come through, just in case I have to step into that ownership place again, just in case I have to take care of myself. That's what orphans do. They believe that there is no good father looking after them and so they take into their own hands what they can do. It happens in the spiritual realm and we have a bunch of spiritual orphans sometimes sitting in churches that don't understand that they have a good, good father in heaven who has every spiritual blessing ready to give them in the adoption as sons and daughters that they would be connected to a father in heaven. But beyond that, that is good news, but beyond that, we do it in our, in our physical lives and with our material things. We take a hold of them and we have this orphan mentality that says, well, I, I'm just going to take whatever I've got because I'm not sure if the next meal is coming from. I'm not sure where the next thing is. And we, we hold it and we hoard it and we hold it tightly instead of being thankful in trust to understand that my good dad in heaven is providing how much of my needs? Some of my needs? No. All. And when we step into that faith place, when we step out and trust that that is exactly what he promises to do because he is a good dad, then I no longer have to hold selfishly onto the things that I've accumulated. I can be generous with what I've got. See, it's difficult to be generous with what you have until you're thankful for what you have. Difficult to be generous with what you have until you're thankful for what you have. See, when we truly enjoy what we have and we're thankful for it, it's natural for us to want to just share that with other people. Pastor Ryan, he makes like jerky. He sure does. And so, you know, he'll, he'll bring some into the office. He brings it in like contraband, you know. He'll, he'll bring it in and say, Psst, John. I did a new batch, you want some? I'm like, yeah, give me a bag, give me two. 
Because it's just delicious. Now, he does that. Why? Because he is just... He, 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 he broods over it at home. You know, he slices that meat. He spices that meat. He puts it in the drying rack and he brings it in and he's tasted it already. And he goes, oh, this is so good. John's going to love this. And, and he gives me a couple of packets and I'm just like, oh, I want some more. That is so good. Why does he want to share it? Why is he so thankful? He's so thankful for what he's got. He just wants to give it away. He knows it's good. And that's how we should be in our lives with Jesus, right? We're so thankful for what we've received, for what we know is true, for what people stand here and testify about in their lives about what Jesus has done, that we want to be able to give it away. We're thankful for it. We don't hold on to it. We want to share it with everybody else. And the same goes for our material possessions. See, generosity is not just an overflow of our thanksgiving, although it happens that way. It's actually the way you were created. You were designed to be generous. Did you know that? There is not one single person in the world who was designed to be stingy, to be a miser, to be tight-fisted. Not one person in the world. And I can give that with 100% guarantee. You know how I can give that with 100% guarantee? Because guess whose image you were made in? You were made in the image of God. And our God is an incredibly generous God. And because he's an incredibly generous God, every person made in his image deep down somewhere is supposed to exhibit generosity because it was in the way you're designed. It's in the way you're created. And one of the best lies the enemy has ever told us is that that's not your true design. You don't have a good dad in whom you take after. You just kind of be yourself, look after yourself and look at the rest of the world. Look at how it operates. Look at the systems of the world we kind of get sucked into with regards to you look after yourself. But generosity, generosity just takes that far and wide because we serve a generous God because our God is a giver. We're supposed to be givers as well. What does the Bible say in John 3, 16? For God so loved the world that he? Yeah. Yeah, he didn't just write a poem or a love song or whatever it might be. He actually gave. That's right. He did it. And because he's a generous God, we should be a generous people. I'm going to get her up to preach in just a minute. That'll really freak her out, but it's going to be good. See, when you flip through the characteristics of the early church, you can come across some really defining passages of what generosity looks like. You get to Acts chapter 2 and you read something like this. It said, all the believers were together and had everything in common. That doesn't mean they all looked the same. doesn't mean they all thought the same. It doesn't mean that they all came from the same background. doesn't mean they all became you know, like robots or whatever. It means this. They sold property and possessions to give anyone who had need. And the Lord added to the number daily those who were being saved. I love the way Gordon MacDonald puts it. He writes it like this. He said, there was no separateness between Christ followers and the early church. The rich and the poor came together and there was an overflow of sharing so much that it seemed as if the fellowship engaged in share and share alike. There's a deep principle at work here. Profound conversion of the heart produces natural generosity. Profound conversion of the heart. What's McDonald saying? He believes this passage is saying when there's truly a change that's taken place, not just a, a, a words without actions to follow, but when we love the Lord our God with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, all our strength, everything that we have, when a profound change comes to a heart like that, it makes a difference. And it's at that point it produces natural generosity. He said, the power of Christ unbound the selfish heart. Isn't that lovely? It generated a love and compassion between people that was so intense that no one could hold on to anything extra when someone else appeared in personal need. I want to be in a church like that. I want to be a people like that. If there's anything that's actually going to rock this city so that they would start to understand the generosity of our loving God is when his people are going to start to become radically generous. Because it's not the way of the world. 
It's the way of the kingdom. And the kingdom always looks a little upside down to the way of the world. But you know what? It has a profound impact. Generosity is that quality of being kind. It's that understanding that's not selfish. It's the quality of being generous. And especially willingness to give money and other valuable things. So when we talk about generosity, we're not just talking about possessions. We're not just talking about our wealth or our money. You can be generous in action. You can be generous with your words. You can be generous with your love. However, inevitably, generosity comes down to being able to share or give away that which you have. Winston Churchill once said that you make a living by what you get, but you make a life by what you give. You can make a living by what you get, but you make a life by what you give. So if our first life hack is to stop and be thankful, the second is this. Look for opportunity to become generous. Look for opportunity. The Apostle Paul, he writes to the church in Corinth, and Corinth is a busy, bustling, you know, town where there's a city and it's you know, like a major hub for, for trade and all sorts of things that are going on. And the church there, they're doing great in lots of different stuff. And he's bragging to the church in Corinth about the church in Macedonia. A church is a group of churches that are poor, a group of churches that don't have it all. And he's saying, guys, you should see how these people gave. You should see the generosity of these Macedonians. It was absolutely blew me away, Paul says it like that. Because it's just unbelievable. It's incredible. And then he says this to the Corinthians. You can read about it in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And in verse 7 he says, Since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love that we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. Paul was saying, I see you growing in your faith. I see you grow in knowledge. That's awesome. But you know what? As much as you grow in love and faith and understanding and, and, and you're doing such a great job at that, see to it that you actually grow in how you give. See, there's an element of discipleship about following Jesus that involves our understanding of giving. And we need to look for opportunity that's going to help us grow in giving, grow in our generosity. Listen to Proverbs 22 verse 9. It says, whoever has a bountiful eye will be blessed, for he shares his bread with the poor. Kind of get the, the picture here? The person who shares their stuff, in this case, bread with the poor. But what's a bountiful eye? What's that got to do with it? A bountiful eye will be blessed. Well, in the Hebrew, you can, the word is also translated as generous, literally good. So whoever has a good eye, whoever has a generous eye, that person will be blessed. We usually hear about generous heart, don't we? Oh, you're such a generous of heart person. God, just such a generous Generous heart on that person. The Bible talks about having a generous eye. It's another way of saying we can look for opportunities on how to be generous. We can see things differently. People that are generous, they see things differently from people who are not. Generosity becomes the filter through which they take up opportunity. They look to see what they can be doing to bless other people. People who are generous, they see things that, that, that becomes a, a different way of life for them. Now, if I was to do a spot poll right now, and I said to all of you, who wants the blessing of God on their life? Who wants God's blessing? Who wants to be blessed? I'm putting both hands up. I don't think there'd be a hand in the house that wouldn't go up, right? We want the blessing of God. You'd be kind of crazy not to. Why, Why would you want to live without it? You want the blessing of God in your life. But I tell you what, it comes with a condition. 
that, that comes with the condition of being generous. Look what it says here. Whoever has a bountiful eye, whoever has a generous eye, a good eye, who sees through that lens, that's who's going to be blessed. Don't expect to be blessed if you're stingy. Generosity trusts in God. Stinginess trusts in self. Generosity trusts in God. Stinginess trusts in self. If we find it to be freely generous, we have become more attached to the gift than we have to the giver. If we find it difficult to be generous, we've become more attached to the gift than the giver. We ought to be the conduit through whom the Lord can pour his blessing, knowing how to disperse it out around us. I like how Jesus puts it. Jesus is teaching through the Sermon on the Mount and he's teaching right into the heart of some really heavy topics. He's talking about marriage. He's talking about adultery. He's talking about divorce. He's talking about making promises and giving and praying and fasting and being real and all this sort of stuff that gets way beyond below the surface and starts touching the innermost part of our heart, right? And then Jesus lands on the thing that's going to reveal your heart quicker than any other topic that he's talked on so far. And it's our attitude about our treasure, about our money, about our finances, our possessions, our stuff. And in Matthew chapter 6, this is what he said, verse 19, he says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves can break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where no moths or vermin do not destroy, where the thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And he goes on, verse 22. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Jesus refers to the eye. It's a little bit like our parable that we looked at in Proverbs. This parable, sorry, this, this little this line in Proverbs. Now, the Greek for healthy here implies the meaning of generous and unhealthy implies the meaning of being stingy. So Jesus says, the lens by which you allow everything to come in by, the eye, the lamp of your body, is what your life will become. A pure eye, a generous eye, it's going to let sunshine into your soul. But an evil eye, a stingy eye, it's going to shut out the light and plunges you into darkness. And if you think that that is the light that you really have, you don't know how dark you really are. That's what Jesus is saying. He says, but you know when your eyes are good, when your eyes are generous, when they reflect the very nature of generous God, then we can focus on him and your eyes will focus on goodness. And Jesus said those eyes are going to pour sunshine into your soul. You'll be blessed. But when your eyes start going bad, when they're stingy, well, then it's going to start to shift the focus onto the stuff of this world and your, your heart's going to get deceived and you're going to start thinking things like, I need more, I'm not content, I'm not thankful, I'm not, you know, I'm not filled with gratitude for what I have, I need the next best. And it might seem that all of this sunny and it's bright and you've bought into the illusion of all the glitz and the glamour of all the things that the world's throwing at you as if it's the real deal. And Jesus said, if that's the light you're trusting, you have no idea what dark place you're really in. See, when your eyes are generous, you're going to see the world from a different perspective. And generosity becomes the filter through which you take up opportunity. Look for opportunity to be generous. Now this third life hack, it just kind of really, I've been talking about it the whole way through. I've just done what preachers do and put a third point in. <laughs> just be intentional. That's a really simple life hack. Be intentional. The first life hack was to stop and be thankful. You need to be intentional about stopping. 
when is it you're going to stop and make it a daily habit to stop and be thankful? You know, common psychology would call it cognitive behavioral therapy. It was first found in the good book. It can change your whole way of thinking when you stop and you're just grateful. You stop and you're thankful. But when are you going to stop? Are you going to stop before you go to bed at night? Just before you lay your head down on that pillow? Are you going to stop long enough to just name a few things at which you're thankful for? Are you going to get up in the morning and have a look outside and just start by saying, God, it's a new day. I'm thankful. Yeah, I'm still moving. It's a good day. Thank you, God. Thank you. I'm grateful. I had a roof over my head. I'm grateful I have someone who loves me. I'm thankful that I have food in my tummy. I, I'm grateful, I'm thankful, and we start building up this, uh, this bank because you can either feed the negativity or you can feed the thankfulness. What are you going to do to intentionally stop and give thanks? To give thanks to God, to be full of gratitude to Him. Now, generosity also has to be intentional. Just like we intentionally want to stop to be thankful, we need to be intentional about it. I read a devotion in the last couple of weeks that was talking about, it said, it's, it's, generosity is not an amount. Generosity is not even an attitude. Generosity is a plan. Generous people plan how they're going to be generous. They think about, what can I do? Because they see the opportunity, because they're seeing through good, healthy, generous lenses at the world around them. They're thinking about, what can I give away? Not what can I consume? What can I have? What can I take next? But what can I give away? Because I serve a good dad, and my good dad will take care of all my needs. And so I'm not afraid I'm going to lose out here. I can afford to be generous. And they plan on their generosity. They plan on what they are doing. You know, what I love about our church is that we've made the decision to be a generous church. We give to those in need. We serve our local community. Just this week, we got the best email in. It was from a lady. She's a Christian. She works in, uh, with aged care. And she visited a house she'd never visited before, but it's a house that we've visited before through our street teams. And her family's been going there not just once, twice, but three times. And this lady was expressing her gratitude, her thankfulness for this church and those people who have come and loved on her. She couldn't believe that it was free. She couldn't believe that it took the weight off her as an older person having to bug her family to come over and to help her. But there's this community and this lady said, I need you to know that what you are doing is making a difference in the community. I heard just recently, like last Thursday morning, I was at a prayer breakfast and, and uh, uh, one of my friends had, had, had just heard from uh, one of our, our churches that we used to get along with really well in Kenmore region when we were right in that hub of it over there. And they said, oh, we miss having you guys just so local and handy. You know why? Because you're just such a generous church. Isn't it good to be known as a generous church, a generous people? Just this year alone, when we've given out to those in needs, there have been like dozens and dozens and dozens of hampers and buckets of joy that we've been able to give away. You can read about those in the quarterly mag. We've just been just pursued by God's love to just want to go and share some of what we've been giving. You guys have been incredibly generous when it has come to being able to, to get us to this point of having this facility. Did you know that 300 generous family units or people, just 300 have given more than $2.5 million for this facility in sacrificial giving. Only 300 have been our sacrificial givers that enabled us to start this journey here. How generous, how incredibly, incredibly generous. But what if you became a little more intentional in your generosity? What if you became a planning, generous person? And, and when it came to giving at church on a Sunday, you just didn't reach into your pocket and go, oh, what change have I got? And I'm going to need that for McDonald's because I don't know very much and I'll just give that. But what if you, you plan to give? 
What if you just generously plan to give? Imagine that. Imagine the death. This is not generous giving. I'll give the leftovers. Generous giving is when we plan to give. When we're thinking about and we're seeing things from a different perspective and we know who's in charge and in control of what we've got. I am so thankful to God for this year. For all that he's done and all that, that, that has happened throughout this year. We, we, we are... We are being so blessed. I am so thankful. I want that thankfulness to well up in our hearts, that we would all just be so full of gratitude to God and what he's doing amongst us, that it would just become into an overflow of generosity in our hearts and our lives. You know, this little River Life Herald that we put together that came floating down over the top of you during that song has the testimonies of real life people who were brave enough to jump in the story box and we've just pulled some of the quotes out of there to be able to share with you. This is the reason we wanted to share it with you. Hear me carefully. This is not about us bragging about what a great church we are. It has nothing to do with us. This all has to do with the glory of God. And when we get over ourselves, we can be people proud enough to say, God is worth the honor. He is worth the glory. He is worth me standing up on a soapbox and shouting out all that he has done. And the other side of it is this, that this actually now allows you access to the testimony because it tells us that the spirit, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. What you're hearing and seeing in the lives of other people is legitimate ground for you to go, God, would you do it again in my life? Would you do it again in my life? And as you read over these things, as we build this culture and you start to hear about what God is doing, it is firm permission for you to be able to say, God, I want that to happen in my life. Let it happen. 